Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Atomic Podcast. This is number one in a series that focuses on really emerging scientists, entrepreneurs, as well as leaders in the areas of quantum, um, nanotechnology, and AI. And the reason I bring all those three up, because they actually are no longer separate areas, uh, domains of knowledge and technical skill and so forth. They actually are convergence points that I really want the Atomic Podcast and for all of you to experience as we go forward. Today, I'm super excited to be introducing you to Brett Kornick. Uh, Brett is one of those emerging scientists, entrepreneurs that I think is a great example of what it means, one, to be to go through your educational process, to come out the other side, um, uh, experiment, uh, solve problems, but also then be able to conceptualize and find the kinds of problems that are uh, really uh, relevant today, relevant to certain generations, and also relevant to really our planet and the way in which we interact in science in general. So I'm going to turn it over and uh, start to ask some questions and for Brett and I to get started. So Brett, I want to th- welcome you. Really, thank you so much yeah, for, thank for, you. For, for coming and being here. So one of the things that I, I'm really interested in, and, uh, and of course we had the privilege to work together for some time, is, is really how... What is your background? How did your background parlay into the kind of work you were doing and then some of the ideas that sprung out of that work to, for you to start your own company? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll start with my my undergrad. I went to USC. I got a chemical engineering degree. I, As an 18-year-old, I had the starry-eyed view that I could change the oil and gas companies from the inside. Um, you know, Then I, I went through college. I became a little bit more of a realist. Um, but it really gave me a lot of great exposure to... Um, just how enabling uh, chemistry knowledge can be just in operating and, and living in this world. I mean, it got me much deeper into uh, material science, so the science of, of designing and predicting and, and simulating new materials. Um, you know, there's, there's a saying in material science that, like, every single human age has been defined by the materials we use, you know, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, now, you know, the, the Silicon Age. And so it's just so integral to how we operate as, as human beings. And um, I got really into uh, computational material science, so using computer tools and simulations to actually try and predict new materials and, and predict how they're going to behave. Um, from there, I just fell even more and more in love with uh, using computer tools to improve the workflows and collaboration abilities of scientists across different domains. Um, and that led me to uh, this growing movement in the blockchain space that's called decentralized science or, or DSI as they, they call themselves. And um, it's all about using uh, cryptographic and blockchain tools in order to improve collaboration um, across the sciences in terms of open publishing, um, science funding, um, or just operational collaboration. So um, sharing data or, uh, uh, you know, training machine learning mod uh, algorithms from from global different distribution centers uh, you know it's 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 all uh it's all about collaboration on a global scale, and um, I really fell in love with just how that uh, that community really is supporting um, new up and coming scientists that are early in their career. So um, we decided to start our our company. Uh, it's called Impact Finance, um, and we are focused on using crypto tools to um, improve funding of science. Um, I spent a couple of summers at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and uh, my group leader there was spending 90% of his time searching for new funding opportunities, and you know, all of us uh, underneath him were doing all of the actual research work, and that's just not how it should be, and it's a very common story in in science. So um, we are, are trying to get very... Uh, creative in how we're sourcing our science funding, and we're looking at um, tapping into traditionally untapped markets for sourcing that funding, uh, primarily the uh, gaming and media market. So um, really excited about what we're working on. Um, yeah, and I'd be happy to obviously jump more into detail on that, but I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, so, so Brett, one thing um, I wanted you to touch maybe back on is this, this idea that material science sort of drives an entire age or epic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the idea that materials themselves are really the fuel for the new economy, it's so foundational, and yet so few people realize that. Um, you know, AI be, has become a kind of uh, darling of, you know, mainstream consciousness. And really, uh, here is the unsung hero in many respects. So can I, can I ask you two questions? One is that how do you see AI and material science converging and moving forward so that materials become more, one, available, and I should say higher performance? And, and also the other thing is, 
what led you to, besides the funding silo, or I should say the funding burden that you saw your, your PI and, and teachers um, uh, experiencing, what is, what is that um, open access or that I, I be, uh, idea of sharing that you're, you're so focused on? And what would you be sharing? Yeah, sure. Um, so your your first point about uh, AI for materials, um, you know, I'll say like AI doesn't do anything in a vacuum. Um, it, it's only as useful as the, the problems you apply it to, to work on. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of materials data that's starting to be produced now that all of the uh, materials producers are understanding the importance of recording and, and keeping and organizing their data. And uh, obviously, the more data you get, the easier it is to implement AI insights or, or gain in AI insights into your into your data. So there's a number of projects or companies that are working on um, using AI tools specifically to help increase um, the speed at which researchers can get to a material. So, um, for instance, say you have a sparse data set of maybe 10 data points of, of um, processing data for creating your uh, new alloy that you have, um, and you want to increase its strength or you want to increase its temperature uh, resistance. Um, you can use these new AI tools to essentially uh, guide the direction in which you have to move your your processing steps in order to achieve those uh, those results. And um, that's kind of you know that was that was in vogue three years ago <laughs> before this kind of explosion of of large language models and the mainstream adoption of of Chat GPT. And so um, I think that we're really going to see um, things move forward now. I think that the the data silos that exist in the materials industry are going to start to come down because the entire industry is going to be able to realize how much faster it can move forward um, when those silos don't exist and when there's open sharing of data all across the industry. Um, now, th that's a pretty strong incentive as it is, just being able to, to improve the speed at which you can get a product to market. But um, there's additional incentives that can be baked into this data sharing uh, 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 thing that, that I think that Web3 and, and blockchain and DeSci really gives a lot of um, opportunity for. Um, and essentially... Uh, you, you see these different data marketplaces popping up where anytime some user accesses your data set or uses your data set to um, train an AI model or something like that, you can be benefited um, with some sort of token or some sort of digital incentive um, that rewards you for that use of that data. So not only now are we going to see, I think, these um, intrinsic benefits of sharing data and breaking down these silos, but then also these explicit uh, uh, monetary benefits that you're, you're able to create with these new data marketplaces. So I'm um, pretty excited for that space. I think that um, the the marriage of of all of these technologies together is is you know the most exciting place to to be working in right now, um, and I think that it's all going to move really really fast. I mean, we already see it, and it's it's going to be breaking at breaking next speeds uh, moving forward. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm a little scared for it, but I'm excited for it. <laughs> so one of the things that I, I take away from what you just said is that the um, the use of AI uh, does one thing principally, and that is to accelerate the discovery and uh, move to product. Is that correct? In other words, it's an, it, it's an accelerator. But is it does it have other benefits besides accelerating the material discovery process? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think that we haven't even really found out what all the benefits will be yet, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but you can think of it, I mean, I, I got so much use out of AI and, and this boom of chat GPT right as I was trying to start my, my first venture because as, um, you know, I, I was I was raised as a as a math and science geek. I, I got an engineering degree. I had no knowledge of, like, brand strategy or marketing or, or finance or all these different facets of... Um, you know, starting a new startup that you have to know about uh, that you just don't if you're a, a scientist coming out of some PhD program or out of some, um, uh, you know, straight out of college. You just don't, you don't have those tools yet. And I've been able to rely on AI for a lot of those uh, different um, things that I needed to get this venture up off the ground that I wouldn't have been able to do, you know, by myself just even a year and a half ago. So um, maybe it's, it's not just... Um, 
you know, helping to improve the technology itself, but also enabling the scientists and the founders that want to get this technology to market with all the other tools that they haven't actually already been equipped with. And I think that's a very powerful tool, too. Yeah, it's super powerful. And so could you talk a little bit about this um, idea of, of DSI and uh, blockchain and how that sort of enables more clearly this, this one, the breaking of silos from a data standpoint, but breaking of silos in terms of collaboration and mm -hmm. knowledge sharing? Yeah, sure. Um, so the two, I would say, biggest uh, challenges that DSI is trying to tackle right now are around academic publishing and academic funding. Um, on the publishing side, you know, so you as a taxpayer, I assume you pay your taxes, you as a, as a taxpayer, you are funding um, science. You're, a lot of your money is going to like NSF or NIH, and that gets used to fund science um, that is selected by, you know, their committees. Um, however, once that science is funded and then it's conducted and then the results of it are published, most of that work is published behind paywalled journals. So you as the funding source, the taxpayer that funded this research, doesn't actually get the opportunity to um, read the results of the research even because it's um, you know behind Springer or Elsevier or some of these other publishers that are making huge amounts of money. Um, as a researcher, if you want to publish a journal article open access, meaning anyone can see it, it's not behind a paywall in Nature, I believe you have to pay, I think it's I think it's $1,000 that you have to pay Nature extra up front to make it so that they can um, uh, publish your article open access. And so, you know, researchers that already are not paid what they should be paid, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just such a hurdle for them to make it so that everyone can see their work. Um, so there's a lot of work being done in um, how about or how can we use blockchain tools to make it so that whenever uh, an article is accessed, it can be linked to other um, research artifacts. So maybe you have like a, a living like chain or a living graph of different research artifacts as opposed to like disconnected PDFs. Um, and then how can we also incentivize um, uh, scientists as their journal gets that gets um, accessed. Uh, there's also a big problem with um, peer review right now. Um, it's it's very difficult to incentivize researchers to adequately peer review different journal articles. And there's also a big replication uh, challenge in, challenge in uh, science right now. And a big reason for that is a lot of data sets get cherry picked, um, and research gets kind of selected for what's going to be the most publishable in the eyes of these major publishers. Because there's kind of this publish or perish mentality in science right now where if you're not publishing your work in the most prestigious of journals you know your career isn't going to make it so it's a big disadvantage to anyone who is not already uh you know a player in in our legacy system it's it, it really makes it difficult for um, researchers from disadvantaged communities or underrepresented groups to actually get their work out there um, and you know the money follows the the publishing accolades so mm -hmm. if we can try and do this in a much more open access and fair way one us as the funders the taxpayers can benefit from being able to just access it and see it but two um, researchers uh, and the research community can become a much more diverse and, and equitable space uh, super, super interesting, uh, also troubling, yeah. you know. Uh, what I'm also hearing here is, uh, in terms of inclusion, uh, to focus on inclusion, inclusion is really key, uh, not only to um, uh, to certain communities, but also to the integrity of science, you know. And then, and, and then secondly, the idea that they're what is most sort of attractive to publish Really, if that is what you're fighting against, you're fighting against a, a sort of monster. And um, it's almost like you're fighting against the entertainment value mm -hmm. of, 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 of science. Um, but I, something that really comes to mind is that um, I wonder what this does and what your research has shown and, and your company as you've been bringing it uh, to life uh, about innovation. So those counterintuitive ideas, those those outlying ideas, those ideas that we all think that the scientist sort of is known to to, to produce, doesn't get produced because of this mm -hmm. paradigm you're describing. Is do you see that's the case, and you're trying to break that down? Um, yeah, I think that lots of times you'll see that funding doesn't go towards like non-translatable research, so research that can't be directly applied into a product. Um, mm -hmm because you know a lot of that research is foundational to actually creating the things further down the stream that we use and, and love every day but um, 
you know, especially at, say, uh, you're not going to get VC funding or, or any type of enterprise funding for some type of research that's foundational unless it's coming from, like, one of the major corporations like Google that wants to, to really start some initiative. But, um, yeah, so you're, 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 I think, limiting the scope to which new ideas can be formed because you're, you're funding only the most um, publishable and the most um, translatable into, into product uh, research, even though that that's not always the most important research to be done. Um, so I, I do think that's an issue. I think that what would help is, um, and, and you know, this this might sound kind of intuitive, but you still don't see it very often. Uh, a, a lot of a lot of scientists uh, that want to be entrepreneurs, I feel like they focus on uh, producing their technology that they're working on that's in their in their scope, and then once they've produced that technology, they try and um, push it into the market as a product. And I think that a much more um, outcomes focused approach, you know, more of a, 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 a pull than a push type of, of marketing approach would work better. Um, you can see, you know, say that uh, as a scientist, you are focused in agriculture um, and improving sustainability of agriculture. And your outcome is let's, you know, remove um, uh, pollutants from the fertilizer production process. If you focus on that outcome from the beginning and you take a technology agnostic approach to reach that outcome, I think it really helps to broaden uh, the horizon of what you can um, uh, achieve and, and what you can actually integrate because I think it's starting from broader and narrowing down is much easier than starting from narrower and trying to extrapolate and broaden it out. So um, I, I think that that's one learning scientists could take um, is, is start from outcomes and work backwards as opposed to vice versa. And how is an outcome, uh, outcomes-based approach something that um, your company is, is focused on or encouraging? Um, well, so... <laughs> Our, our, our main outcome that we started with was we want to improve funding towards science and we want to make it more equitable. Um, I would say that, you know, this is it's kind of a learning that I've taken over the course of really the last like six months. Um, when we started our, our venture, we had this very um, specific technology that we wanted to use to achieve our goal. It was the idea of this IP NFT. So essentially, when you as a user fund some type of research, um, you would get an NFT that represents a fraction of ownership of the underlying research IP. So if that IP then gets commercialized and, and finds commercial success, you can, you can receive rewards. Um, you can, you know, if you have any uh, familiarity with securities law, you can see how that's a problem here in the U.S. Um, the, you know, those NFTs would certainly be be thought of as unregistered securities. Um, that's a whole nother topic that I, I don't need to go down that road. I think that, you know, because of how um, the European Union handles those types of assets, they're going to be able to move ahead of us in in that uh, in this IP NFT and, and blockchain for science space. Um, however, us being a U.S. company, we began to narrow focused on this technology that we wanted to use to achieve our goal. And we've now since you know, kept the outcome, been like, okay, how can we broaden the tool set that we're using? How can we be a bit more technology agnostic in order to reach this and achieve it? Hmm. Could you, uh, for a moment, I'm, I'm kind of taking a little bit of a, a pivot away, but just for, for our audience, if you could uh, talk a little bit about blockchain technology, really kind of, you know, what the vision was, what it is, some bumps in the road in terms mm -hmm. of your, your application of it. Yeah, I guess I'll start by saying I've never seen an industry shoot itself in the foot so uh, <laughs> intently as the crypto industry has. And it's it's discouraging um, because I, I do think that there's so much potential in it. And, you know, the things that get the headlines are, you know, FTX collapse, you know, JPEG monkeys trade for a million dollars. And it's just all so much noise in, in an industry that really actually does have a lot of, of meaningful um, um, projects and, and work being done. Um, I think that uh, we're still we're, we're still at the very beginning of all of this, and I actually think that uh, 
the marriage of blockchain and AI is going to be very essential for digital technologies moving forward. Um, because with the rise of, you know, deep fakes, spam content, all of this BS that's being produced by, you know, spammers with powerful AI tools, we're going to need tools to publicly verify the authentic authenticity of the digital content that we're consuming. And the best way to do that is through, a, you know, a public ledger of, of cryptographic signatures or, or, or zero knowledge proofs, um, ZK proofs as they're called. Uh, so there's, um, there's so much tooling, I think in the blockchain space that like maybe came around, uh, earlier than we even needed it. <laughs> you know, some people say that Crypto still hasn't found it, its killer use case yet, and I really do think its its killer use case is going to be authenticity in this digital world of of AI produced spam. And how does authenticity and verification apply to science in this regard? Oh, I mean, fake news <laughs> is going to be very easy to produce and make it look like it's real, authentic, published science journals. Um, imagine, you know. I could probably do it right now. I could probably throw into chat GPT, produce a uh, three page journal article proving to me that the earth is flat, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it would probably spit out something that's that's pretty good. I'm not sure what um, guardrails maybe open AI has put to to keep people from doing that. But that that ability certainly will be um, available in the near future if it's not now. And um we shouldn't rely on solely on the consumer to know whether or not something like that is true or false. Obviously, with the flat Earth thing, it's it's you know general knowledge. <laughs> uh, but there's there's probably um, there's a lot of subjects out there that aren't going to be general knowledge, and I think it'd be really easy to deceive large portions of the population with inauthentic um, but real looking uh, research publications. So, um, if we could have each one of these publications that's you know signed with some sort of cryptographic key to prove that it was by this researcher or by this organization or or you know so name it, um, I think that that's going to be a very powerful tool. And it doesn't just apply to you know obviously science applies to any type of digital media. Yeah, and you're touching on something that's I think a real pain point socially, which is um, do we and can we trust science? Um, I know it's a big question. I mean, for myself, it's a big yes, but the, the point is, I think people from a more uh, general perspective, um, they don't know what to trust. And coming out of COVID, uh, I think perhaps even a whole a generation that has seen uh, climate um, discussions come and go um, and have seen you know social divisions uh, grow. So the idea that science can actually help us in the way that we grew up or the way that you know, our parents grew up, has has really changed a bit in mm -hmm. public consciousness. I'm not so sure it's changed in a practical sense, but it's definitely changed in terms of people's perception, what you can trust and what not. So I'm just really curious, and and how when, as you've been building this company, have you been sort of thinking about and addressing? It sounds like authenticity, you know, and verification on a blockchain um, paradigm is super important to building trust. But what other things does your company really kind of look to to bring this this open access, so to speak, or distributed access to science and verifying that science mm -hmm. to people's lives? And and how does that how does that work? Yeah, I uh, it's almost like you uh, were reading straight from one of our slide decks because one of our our big things is um, how can we raise public trust in science? Um, that was one of our our big goals from the outset, and you know. One of the best ways to do that is just raise participation in science. Kind of change the the definition of of who is a scientist. You know, I, I think that when um, you know uh, people think of a scientist, they think of a, a white lab coat and you know their goggles in in some laboratory. But you know, that's not exclusively what makes a scientist. I feel like a scientist is anyone that out there that is like pursuing um, true knowledge, uh, and I think that. If we can just lower the barrier to actually participate in the scientific process, maybe that is through funding science, maybe it's through just being able to read the published journal articles, you know, then I really think that we can help to raise that public trust. Because right now, the the easiest, um, you know, the, the best way that you have to participate in science right now is to go to a four-year college, then get a PhD and and go get a degree or you can maybe you know have a lot of money and and start a venture that is 
um, commercializing a technology. It, it's just way too high of a barrier to entry to actually really meaningful, contr meaningfully contribute and participate. So we really want to lo lower that barrier for participation. So how would someone find you and start to participate? And I, that can be like literally today or what your vision is for that participation going forward. Yeah. So um, our, our platform that we're building uh, for funding science, it's, it's called In Theory. And I mentioned earlier that um, we were really trying to tap into like the gaming and, and avatar markets for uh, funding science. And so what In Theory does is it allows um, any user to create a 3D avatar um, that then gets new accessories, new backgrounds, new poses um, every time you fund a science project or a research group that's on the In Theory platform. So essentially you're able to create this uh, 3D avatar that is a full reflection of your contributions to science. Um, and then you can export that avatar uh, for use anywhere in, you know, as a 2D PFP on your social platforms or uh, for use in like Unreal Engine or Unity or any other type of gaming engine. Um, um, eventually, we want to uh, be able to make it so you can really take this avatar anywhere with you that you go in the digital world, whether it's like social VR platforms, whether it is, um, you know, your favorite you know, video game that you're playing. Um, and we really want you to have this what's essentially a, a, a digital um, trophy of your of your science contributions that you can show off to the world um, or at least to the metaverse. <laughs> Um, so another really interesting point, like there's like three podcasts here, but one is <laughs> is is the idea like um, having your avatar sort of based on um, I'll say interactions that build up over time. The the idea of the avatar, as I'm hearing it, is that you're to some degree game of gamifying yeah. this this experience of one accessing science scientific knowledge but also becoming a scientist is is that accurate yeah absolutely and um so I, i've been a I, i've been a big fan of video games since i was six years old i i broke my arm and my mom bought me a playstation one and i played spyro the dragon i've been hooked on on video games ever since um and if you look at how video games have changed in that time one of the largest um changes or 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 improvements to video games now is the level of customization that you can achieve on customizing your character and making it really feel more like your own and more like yourself um and there's huge money there too i mean look at fortnite uh they they there's so much money that goes into customizing your avatar getting new skins getting new accessories um and those are all purely aesthetic you know and in, in, in the larger sense kind of meaningless. It's just an aesthetic uh, uh, change. But now what if that aesthetic change was actually a reflection of, of the contributions you were making in the real world? Um, I think that could be a very powerful tool for directing funding towards science in a way that's just never been possible before. And so you're, you're, you're kind of configuring for me a certain profile of a scientist today. <laughs> you know, uh, that scientist um, has a, f a facility and knowledge of gaming. That scientist is looking to break silos because they're not just going to go for that peer review article in Nature. That scientist is eager to not only go to school, perhaps, but really to step outside of academia. That scientist is an entrepreneurial uh, is entrepreneurial in in their intent. So they're looking to take that next big step. Those that you're sort of creating as you talk with me this wonderful profile you know, uh, of not the scientist of yesteryear, although they, that scientist has many of these components, but of a, of a kind of composite, a kind of synthesis of a scientist today, um, uh, which I think is super exciting. I know in my travels, um, uh, many of the scientists that are, I'll say, more elder in their experience, they, they say, you know, the, the scientists, my, my postdocs, you know, they're they're all looking to start their companies. Now, I don't think it's like 100%. That's good, though. You know, but yeah, but the idea that the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneur comes through with an entrepreneurial attitude as they become a scientist, or as they become a scientist, they, they start to explore the entrepreneurial experience, is something I think is fairly new. Mm. Um, what's been that experience for you? Are you meeting uh, like-minded people like yourself? And and what, what does that profile look like to you? I mean, I totally agree. And... Um, more than that, you're also seeing uh, programs 
popping up to support that type of scientist. Uh, I, I know I had mentioned to you like a, like a week ago, there's um, a new venture science doctorate program that I became aware of that is all about um, equipping scientists with the tools to actually um, produce an entrepreneurial venture um, that's really focused on, you know, deep tech and the sciences, um, you know, so it's almost like, like an MBA on steroids if, if MBAs were full of, of calculus and, and hard science. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think that programs like that, I, I love to see those pop up because um, I, I think that um, with this Cambrian explosion of technologies that we're seeing right now, the, the, the scientists that can interact with those technologies, but also transform them into something that is actually helpful and useful for the for the world at large, is um, is going to be essential because I think there's such a growing divide between um, the everyday person and the technology that they use on an everyday basis. And what I mean by that is like 99.99% of people have no idea how like the a cell phone works, <laughs> you know, and we use them every single day. And for a cell phone, that's not a big deal. But when we get into things like we have no idea how this AI algorithm works <laughs> and I'm using it every day to make substantial life changing decisions, you know, that that's a problem. So we need to be equipping, you know, our our smartest scientists with the tools to also produce something that, that you know, helps in the world uh, because there's just way too much of a disconnect uh, growing right now. And maybe I can make a, a bit of a bridge between scientist and non-scientist because really you're sort of touching on something that, that touches all of us, which is um, we we can use, but we don't always have to understand everything under the hood. A and yet the under the hood is growing exponentially. So um, how does perhaps one, your venture, but two, kind of more broadly, your perspective of, of bringing non-scientists into the scientific kind of... I'll say ethos of, of of research and and discovery, and is that part of your plan as well? Is reaching more perhaps a wider public? Yeah, yeah. So I had mentioned in theory, you know, to create an avatar and contribute to science, you don't have to be a scientist at all. You don't even have to know anything about science. I would assume that if you're using the platform, you're at least interested. Um, but all it requires is uh, is you know a passion for it, and um, I think that. By helping to cultivate that passion, you know, especially, you know, these gamers that are 18, 19 years old, you get them more involved in the scientific process and just pique that interest by allowing them to really do something they're already doing anyway, which is, you know, playing their video games. If you're able to intertwine those two things together, um, and like you said, really gamify this process of science funding, um, then I really think that we can help like I said, to raise the participation uh, of, of all user types and non-scientists in the scientific process. Um, I think that this also opens the door for more funding towards like uh, citizen science projects. Mm -hmm. um, there's a platform called experiment.com that I'm a big fan of that allows really anyone to, to pitch a project onto the platform that it's then like Kickstarter for that project. So um, you see a lot of um, sustainability and, and uh, ecological research being done through that platform by people that are just everyday people that, you know, maybe don't have a traditional PhD or, or something like that. And, um, you know, it, it's really that type of path that, that we want to walk down. And we've gotten a lot of inspiration for, for what we're doing from from the team at Experiment. Oh, that's great. It's good to know. But it sort of reminds me of a, of more of a historical look on, I, I think, sort of what's made this country so special at a certain point, which was the encouragement of inventors and invention, um, which fell within but often outside of any kind of academic institution. So it sounds that, that you're, the, you're, you're pushing citizen scientists, we'll call, or, or the public in general, towards get involved, yeah. right? Science is not for nerds. Yeah. Or, I, I, I really look at, um, Bill Nye was so influential for me as a kid hmm. and his, you know, his intro of science rules. I mean, if, if, if I could co-opt that as a, as our tagline, you know, I totally would. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's that kind of energy, um, that, that we need to continue to channel. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. It's great. Um, there's, there's something that I have to ask a little more scary question, you know, because you were touching on it. So let's say that let, – let, let's, let's change the picture a little bit, you know, from keeping access as it is 
keeping you know the the publishing kind of silos as they are keeping academic institutions as really the only way through into scientific work and practice um what do we stand to lose if we stay with the current paradigm um globally or <laughs> as a country uh, you can address it either way you yeah. can say globally you can say from a global competitive standpoint or just a human standpoint um well i'll, I'll start uh by saying i i think that academic institutions are going to go through a really big change over the next five to ten years and um i think a lot of this is in the u.s driven by you know the student debt crisis it has gotten a, a magnifying lens shined on it over, you know, even just since I've graduated to where I think that now a lot of high school students might be second thinking or, or second guessing whether or not they need to go and to a four year college and get this degree. Um, you're also seeing the rise of so many different um, online learning resources uh, that can teach the, the actual hard job skills that you need to um, to actually function in the workplace. I mean, if, if I was graduating high school right now and I wanted to go be a software engineer, um, I don't know that I would actually go to college. I think that I would just, you know, put aside a thousand dollars for Udemy courses <laughs> um, and take those over the course of, of, you know, one to two years and uh, call it good. And I think that that would, you know, set me up pretty well for for operating in today's software engineering world. Obviously, not all majors are like that, and I think software engineering is the lowest hanging fruit for for transformation like that. Um, but I think that we're going to start to see more and more students look for alternatives to academic institutions. So if we're not able to open up um, participation in science to users that didn't go through that academic process, then I think that we're going to miss out on a lot of potential talent that chose not to go through that process. Um, I think also just uh, a little bit more existentially, um, <laughs> the, you know, the data silos that exist in the world today are not going to allow us to keep up with the, the pace at which innovation is happening. Um, if we were able to just, you know, if there was a fully open data economy and everyone could just access whatever data they needed on their use case, you know, on a whim, um, I think that we would see a much more level playing field in terms of the the speed at which various industries advance. Um, you know, I I know from our time working together that we both saw how much slower the materials industry moves um, because. It, uh, it's got rigid data silos. No one wants to share their data. Data sets are very sparse. Um, and because of that, you know, it can take 10 years or more for a, a material, a new material to get from the lab into an actual product. And um, that's really hampering the pace at which, uh, you, you know, human progress can move forward. Because like I said, we are fully defined by the materials that we use. And almost every engineering problem could, you know, theoretically be solved by a better material. So... Uh, yeah, did that did that <laughs> hit your points? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's just it's just opening up more more conversation. I think a more uh, more of a horizon. Um, soft skills. So um, Coursera, we can go online. We can we can get some of the the basic kind of cognitive based you know uh, training. But what does it look like when we have op more open access? Uh, let's say, in, th in theory, is now a wild billion dollar venture, <laughs> and people are using it as uh, really their kind of go to platform for experimentation, for collaboration, um, and, uh, and also for adding value to the, the work that they're doing and others are doing. That's the way I'm seeing it. Um, but where does soft skills come in, which are so essential to our, our survival, both personally and professionally? Um, and how do you see that in science uh, developing? Uh, if oh, okay, so let me, I'll just say one more thing. When in going through my academic um, research, training, experience, bumping my head, um, it was the bumping of the head. It was the things and the people and the personalities that really were my challenge that I learned so much. Um, mm. It wasn't just pro solving the problem, uh, a calculus problem, for example, or a physics problem or an AI problem. It was how do we solve this together, and what does that together look like? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think I think the one thing that academia or any community has, not just academia, is the idea of belonging, some sense that you're part of something that others are part of. Mm. So I'm just wondering, 
you know, as we go forward and more and more people have opted out of the academic, which is really, you know, at its best community, mm-hmm. um, where the soft skills get formed to really drive passion for science. Yeah. Um, I, I'll start by saying I think it's a little bit overblown um, the myth that scientists don't have soft skills. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm um, not. And by the way, I am not saying <laughs> yeah. that. I'm just saying just just in general. No, but I, that's I super a general. With it's a general perception that it's it like, is, oh, it you're is. an engineer. You're good at math. You're a scientist. You're a nerd. You you know, you don't know how to talk to people. It, that, that is like a stereotype that just rose out of, I don't know, uh, early television <laughs> and has just persisted. And I, I especially after my last year of, of working with the other brilliant scientists that are in, in the DSI community, I just do not think that's the case. Um, and I think that where you'll really see these soft skills develop is in the fact that it's becoming more and more important for your career to have a... Um, it, it doesn't have to be a, a huge social media presence, but it has to it has to exist. I mean, you have to exist on social media in this generation um, in order to help move your career forward. Um, it helps you to share um, what you're working on. It helps you to share your insights. It helps you to just, you know, share everything that you're doing with the world. And um, I, I'm not trying to say that <laughs> social media teaches you all the best soft skills that you need in life because it doesn't. But I do think that we're going to um, see that be a, uh, a big tool for, for not just progressing your, your science career, but also for um, helping you to interact and collaborate. Um, there's, there's just, I, f- I feel like there's a new um, social messaging or social media platform popping up every week, <laughs> um, especially with all the, the drama at Twitter that has been going on over the past year. Um, and I think that we're going to see um, a lot more uh, like community focused uh, digital platforms. So like, um, Discord is a, is a good example. I mean, Discord has blown up so much over the course, you know, just since COVID. It used to just be, you know, mainly for games, um, for video gaming. And now it seems like every single blockchain project has to have a Discord to interact with their community. And I think that you're going to see um, a lot of people really start to uh, use those tools more for um, um, science collaboration and more for, um, you know, kind of building that sense of community that, like you said, you're you're getting out of your academic institution um obviously um this will still very much be supplemented with in real life events and you've seen i mean one thing that has not suffered from covid is um professional conferences those are huge in fact maybe even bigger than ever because people long for that um in-person interaction that maybe they're not getting in their day-to-day job and so i think that those will also continue to be a very integral and important part of um uh, of a scientist's career yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. This uh, paradigm of, of the scientist as nerd and, and socially inept um, it just it, it infuriates, infuriates <laughs> me. But the thing about as we learn and become scientists and also we develop our scientific projects, um, the the fact is is that we, we cross communities. We cross different groups of people. And so we're always learning on that. I, I even hate to use the words uh, um, soft skills, but we learn how to really work with really complicated um, problems but complicated people. And I think that that skill develops over a lifetime. It's not something you, you get credentialed for. Yeah. You know, And so I, I think it's really important what you said about social media. The social media is not only here, but it's super important for us to be kind of forefronting ourselves there. Mm-hmm. But it isn't ourselves. And I know. It's, it's, a, it's a weird paradigm. <laughs> yeah, it, it, is, it is a lot of what we do and maybe how we think, but it isn't the whole person. And I think that gets to be a little dangerous. But what I really think is, is really interesting and important in, in the work you're doing is that you're trying to sort of encourage cross-thinking, you know, cross-domain thinking, cross... You're getting people to, you might say, attack the blank page of science when they, they're not a scientist. You know, you're, you're saying, it's okay, come, you know. Uh, I know the stigma of being a scientist, you have to have a PhD, but hey, no, you know. And I think that... Um, I, I think that's going to not only is resonating, but I think as you mentioned, some of the more social points to that is going to be not a nice to have, but a must have. Mm-hmm. Um, let me ask you this on a, maybe on a competitive level. Um, do you see academic institutions that, as, as you say, they, they're feeling the crunch here too? 
you know. Uh, they may not have the conceptual uh, framework down as you do. Um, most likely they don't. And, and, but the idea is that they know that they're not reaching and they're not retaining, they're not reaching the right students as much as they used to, and they're not retaining the students as much as they did. And so, you know, they're, uh, so I'm just really interested if you think that uh, the academic institutions will get in, in the DSI game. Uh, and what do you see happening there? Yeah, it's happened a, a little bit, and I've had a, a fair share of conversations with um, technology transfer offices about what we're working on and to very mixed responses because, you know, obviously it, it's... Uh, I, I always try to say we're, we're not trying to compete with what technology transfer offices do. We are trying to provide supplemental funding to researchers. And, you know, our platform doesn't even take any IP from a researcher when when their work gets funded through our platform. So we're really trying not to, to compete. But, yes, we have... Uh, just the fact that they're willing to have the conversations with us is a very good indicator of the fact that they understand that certain things are changing and they need to be aware of how they are changing. Um, this, uh, the IP NFTs that I mentioned earlier, um, there are various universities in Europe that are working um, with an IP NFT model. Um, I also believe that um, there was some involvement by the University of Washington um, here in the U.S. with an IP NFT, but um, I don't have full details on that, so I, I, I don't want to go into more, <laughs> more on that. But I, I think if you Google it, you'll find, you'll find some, uh, some relevant results. Um, I, I, think that it, I think that they're going to come along for the ride, and, and I think that they're willing to, um, because you know, academia at its, at its source is always supposed to be on the forefront of um, mm -hmm. what's happening what's new what what's the latest tech so um i, I don't think that uh i don't think there's going to be the friction that i think um maybe some people are anticipating as like this funding and and um participation paradigm kind of kind of shifts I, I think that um it's going to be a much more collaborative and and um two-way process mm -hmm. but it also is a reminder of um the need for incremental change <laughs> um mm -hmm. because you know these are big institutions with with a, a lot of money and a lot of resources and a lot of talent and and knowledge and um it it if, if we want to achieve, you know, the, the ends that we're looking towards, then, you know, our means have to be incremental. You know, Brad, I just want to say, you know, a huge thank you. I mean, um, like I said, there's three, and now I can say there's probably five podcasts that we could do out of the ideas. <laughs> you know, we have the existential, the social level, the technical level. We have the new scientist, you know. We have, you know, blockchain, and there's a lot in all of that because you're touching, in a way, all those different... Uh, ideas and um, I just really hope that that I find more people like you for our podcast that are really s stretching the way we're thinking about science, but also on top of making science possible, you know, in in our current world. So I just want to again thank you very much and yeah, thank you, Rodney. It was it was a pleasure. Um, yeah. Great to see you again. Great to great to chat with you. I, I think it's it's fun when we're just in a room together for an hour. <laughs> I think every t other time we've talked, it's like either on the cell phone or Zoom or yeah. like I'm in my car. Or, yeah. This is like the most we've talked. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's good. It's yeah. been great. <laughs> well, thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Take good to go.